I'm interested in, and will be interested in the future in writing more about um, the long-term effects of our agricultural practices on ecosystem health. So I've started out by talking about pesticides and um, why that, that that entire process is a dead-end process and is not going to get us what we want. We have to rethink how we go about farming. Um, I'm now thinking about how the health of the individual is tightly interwoven with the health of the surrounding environment. And since we as individuals are little ecosystems, we have uh, organisms living inside of us and we are responsible for their health, but they're also responsible for our health. And we keep them healthy by feeding them good food, healthy food. They keep us healthy and in, in that way, we can now live in an environment and not suffer from that environment. We can defend ourselves from that environment. But the point I want to make in that is that the, the interactions between the outside and the inside are complementary. Um, for us to be healthy on the inside, we must be in a, a healthy environment. If we're not in a healthy environment, we can't be healthy on the inside because our health depends on a healthy external environment. So in that sense, what we are doing to the environment is uh, unethical, some might say immoral. If we are destroying our surrounding environment, then we are destroying our capacity for living in a healthy life. <clears throat> and that's due to the fact that we are a system, we aren't a, a thing. We don't eat a food and that food then feeds our body and that's all there is to it. That food feeds an entire ecosystem. And we need a diversity of foods and a diversity of good, high quality foods to feed a diverse, high quality, healthy ecosystem. So what we do to our environment matters. And it matters because our environment is where we get the food that we feed to our ecosystem. And underlying that entire process is soil health. So every farmer who, every small farmer, corporate farmers, are not really people, they are businesses. But a farmer who cares about the soil cares about quality. They care about the health of their environment. They understand that the soil is the basis for food production and that that basis has to be maintained into the future or you lose your capacity for food production. But more than that, the health of the soil is a difficult thing because it's also an ecosystem. So there is this underground ecosystem and it underlines every aspect of our world. And the reason I say that is because we tend to eat plants and plants grow in soil and the plants can't grow normally in a healthy manner without a healthy soil environment. When we add fertilizer, we kill that soil environment. When we add herbicides and pesticides, we damage that environment. When we plow, we kill that environment. So we have to understand what it is that makes healthy soil so that we can make healthy plants. The healthy plants are food for literally everything else. The insects, the birds, the, us, animals that eat plants, and then we might eat those animals. So there is this structure to the world that, as far as we're concerned, ends with us. And everything below us in that structure needs to be healthy if we are going to be healthy. So ultimately, uh, what I'm hoping to focus on in my own work is what it means to live in a world that is healthy for a human being. It has to be a world where human beings care about the world, particularly the soil in the world, but everything that is emerging from that. And so uh, what we are doing to soil today is in my mind highly immoral. We are destroying our world in order to gain short-term success when we should be focusing on what we want not our children or our grandchildren to be experiencing, but people 100 years from now. Is there going to be a world for them and the answer is, if we don't take care of the soil, I'm not sure about that. I, I know all these this conversation and arguments and this and that about organic and sustainable. But I think we need to understand the, the sort of the principles that underlie this. There are 
evolutionary biology principles, they're systems ecology principles, the, the things that, that, that govern life of a group of organisms, not this one species and that one species, this one species. Uh, we're either part of this system or we're destroying the system, and I don't think there's two ways around that. The soil scientists I've talked to, and there are some nearby who are really, really, oh, um, rabid about <laughs> soil health, <laughs> uh, looking for converts. Um, they have not only claimed, but have demonstrated that they can take that awful gray, pale brown, ruined farm soil and they can turn it into rich brown forest soil in two years. Two years. I said one year, and they no, no, two years. Give us two years, we can do this. The first year won't be quite ready. And they do that by no-till farming. They add a multi-species cover crop. So there's not just one species or two species, 12 species of things growing. There's, there's nitrogen-fixing plants, deep-rooted plants, tap-rooted plants, there's grasses. All of this stuff grows in the wintertime when you're not growing crops. And then it dies in hot weather. So you plant winter stuff and it covers the soil so there's no rain. Snow can't get to the soil. The sun can't get to the soil. The soil is protected um, and it stays in place. And then immediately worms move in and bacteria and fungi and spiders and all the creepy crawlies out there move in. And there's a little world out there within one year. The roots go down in the soil and add carbon and nitrogen and structure and air spaces and start to bring back the pores in the soil and uncompact the soil. That's why the big rooted things are so important. Um, and then of the utmost important is that the next year the farmer does not plow it, but just flatten it. Just pull a, a big roller over it, flatten it down, and then drill the seeds for your crop into that. Leave it there because all the spiders are there and all the worms are there. Don't disturb them. They're doing their job. That first year may not be the best year, but by the second year, they have shown that they don't need pesticides or fertilizers anymore. And they're getting crop yields just as good as the guys who are and at a lower cost because they're not spending all their money on driving tractors and diesel fuel and pesticides and herb herbicides. Um, and they, you look at the soil and you go, that's amazing. It's amazing that they can transform the soil. Now getting a farmer to buy into that is the biggest problem they have, but they're demonstrating it. Two points there. If you don't do that, you have incredible erosion problems. And so anything that's on the field, they, <clears throat> some fields can lose 40% of their topsoil in just a couple of years if it rains hard, it just runs right off into rivers, which is why they're now dead zones in you know, the Gulf of Mexico um, and Chesapeake Bay. <clears throat> and when cover crops are used, there's almost zero runoff. So that means any chemicals used, yes, would stay in place. But the second part of that is, if you get a bacterial community going again in that soil, bacteria can do anything. And I mean anything. There's nothing bacteria can't do. If there is a source of carbon in the soil that nothing else is using, there will be a bacterium that adapts to use that carbon. And these pesticides and herbicides, in many cases, they are carbon-based, they're organic molecules. If you have an organic molecule um, um, that has carbon in it, there's going to be a bacteria that will eat it. And so they'll break the stuff down pretty quickly. Now, if you've used, like you've got a toxic dump out there, that's a little bit different problem. But that's not most uh, farming situations. Um, that takes a while. <clears throat> but in a normal situation with fertilizers, which break down very quickly anyway, so it would be, it would be chemicals. Um, pesticides that we'd be most concerned with. Um, the residual lifespan of those chemicals can be fairly long, but if you brought in a healthy soil community between fungi and bacteria, I am certain that they would eliminate those problems in a very short amount of time. This is a, this is a, a system, an ecosystem that's been hugely damaged. And so the farm soils are incapable of doing this on their own. And they're not begin, being given the opportunity anyway. So given the opportunity to reestablish a below ground community, 
things just sort of start taking care of themselves. This is nature at work. Most small to medium farmers would say, if you can show me how to do this, I'll do this. If you can promise me I will save money, I'll do this. And so that's how they're selling soil conservation is, oh yeah, we can get you out of the herbicide business, we can get you out of the insecticide business, and they're like, sign me up, show me how to do this. <clears throat> It'll take two years, but we promise you, your yields will be just as good as the neighbors, but you won't have the costs. So the bottom line goes up. If you can talk that language to farmers, they are all ears. Because they really don't like doing all this damage to their soil. It's the big, the big commercial prod, product, um, you know, production companies, the corporations that own farmland are, and are beholden to shareholders, for instance. Get that stuff out of the ground. It's sort of like cutting down trees in the forest. It's, until you cut those trees, they're not worth a thing. Standing out there in the woods, they're not worth a dime. And so <clears throat> the corporate approach is, you cut them down, you turn them into cash, that is good for us. So if you can get a regular farmer to a situation where he's saving money by not doing this thing that he really doesn't like anyway, like they don't like chemicals all that much. If they can get out of it, they would get out of it, but they feel like they're stuck. would have to be convinced there was a reason that that would bring in more money for shareholders, but it's the agrochemical companies, the biotech companies that are, um, I'm not sure they would see where their upside is for them. Like how do we monetize uh, health of the soil? I can sell you more fertilizers. We can continue to grow food on completely dead soil. In fact, we could go to greenhouses, you don't even need soil. We can do that too, we'll help you. We'll help you build the greenhouses. They only cost a few million dollars, but you'll probably get that money back in the long run. I mean, they will think of ways where technology, something they can sell to you, should be preferable to this, this sort of all natural you know, approach that they don't have a way to monetize. So it's, <clears throat> it's not, it's, it's big ag in the sense that it's the, the agrochemical biotech world that's driving this because um, it's sort of like you know those companies that own lots and lots of fossil fuels and they don't think solar energy and wind energy is the well if I were them I would diversify <laughs> there's a lot of money in wind and solar <laughs> as some of them are now finding out and I think the ones that are that are so, so push, push, push to keep us in coal and, and oil are because they, aren't, they haven't diversified into any other forms of energy. But if big ag would do that, we might see a little bit more movement in that direction. I think farming has become a recipe because we think that <clears throat> the biology is not necessary to make food. Um, it, we, we can deal with this problem in a technological way. So really, I mean, what does a plant do? You take some seeds and you put them in the ground and you give them some water and some fertilizer and some sunlight and a little bit of time and then there they are. This, it doesn't matter whether the soil is healthy or not, you can put fertilizer on there, keep the water going, uh, give them lots of sunlight, plants just grow. Um, and so we, we are treating this very biological process as a somewhat technological process. It's just a recipe for making food, right? Um, <clears throat> and that mindset completely ignores the, the interactions that the plant not only endures but enjoys with the surrounding environment. And there are a number of interactions that are absolutely necessary. Pollinators are necessary. There are a number of interactions that are not necessary, it would seem, like uh, an insect eating the leaves on the plant. But the thing is, plants are adapted to those insects. They have an answer for them. And that answer is typically they can produce 
if not toxins, at least flavors, something that dissuade those insects from eating them. But they don't produce those compounds unless they've been attacked. Now, it, it turns out that a number of those compounds may also contribute to the flavor of, of plants. And I say may, no, they do. Every flavor in a plant is a compound in the plant that is not necessary for growing. What's necessary is protein and chlorophyll and DNA and RNA and all of those things. That's what's necessary, the chemicals that run the plant. But all of these other things, smells and flavors and tastes and toxins, these are all chemicals the plant has made as it has adapted to its world. Almost all of them, if not all of them, are toxic to something that tried to eat them. And so, <clears throat> We, when we turn growing food into a recipe for just do this, this, and this, a series of steps, we're completely ignoring the fact that the plant interacts with the environment in, in innumerable ways. And those interactions contribute to the flavor and the quality and the nuance uh, of the plant. When we grow plants in a completely stress-free environment, we get unstressed plants that don't produce particularly good food or maybe not quite the same quality or maybe not quite the same taste because they never had to do the things that plants have to do to live in the world. And so they're sort of simplified versions of themselves because they've been grown in a simplified world under no stress and maybe in a tent, a greenhouse uh, controlled environment. And so, um, we don't know that most of the time is probably the biggest problem. We don't realize just how much food that we eat comes from these sorts of factory style conditions. And it's a great deal of the fresh produce that we're eating today. All the leafy green stuff, for instance, all the tomatoes. Uh, more and more, anything that's an annual crop is being grown indoors, away from the world, and away from the world that, that created that plant and causes that plant to be what it is. The farmer in 1944, and I chose that date because it's about the end of World War II, before really the world of pesticides and insecticides and, and fertilizers came into being. Um, so we choose that date and say, okay, let's fast forward 60, 70 years to now. Um, <clears throat> what was different then? Well, farming was fairly close to the traditional style. It was expanding. We were going to larger and larger expanses. The Dust Bowl era proves to us that we certainly had the capacity to damage the land in a very big way. Um, some of that our fault, and some of it just, that's just the way the weather happened to turn out for several years in a row and caused the problem. But the farmer was less capable of doing the kinds of damage we do now. The farmers were plagued with pests. Cotton farmers cried out to Congress that they didn't know what to do with the boll weevil and, and a couple of other cotton plants and what could, what we need something. And that was the response in 1947 was DDT. And like I say, many farmers were delighted with that response because it seemed to be salvation. If we fast forward, oh, and by the way, uh, crop losses on average in the 1940s was, uh, has been estimated at about one third. So about a third of the crop was lost from, <clears throat> from, from the field to the marketplace one way or another. It wasn't always pests, it was just other ways of, it could be shipping, it could be handling, it could be other ways. But about a third of the crop was lost <clears throat> from the field to the marketplace. If we fast forward to uh, 70 years later, uh, we've done massive damage to, the, to the, uh, our land, our soil, uh, ecosystems, uh, species of naturally occurring plants and animals disappeared. Um, we've been over that, but the really, really important message is that the promise of chemicals, the promise of technology was we can, we can save you from nature. We can protect your crops and help you get those crops to market. and. If this one fails, we'll make another one and it will do the job and we're going to solve this problem. In 2014, 70 years later, 
the average losses in crops was about one-third. The difference was that farmers are now absolutely addicted to the use of pesticides and fertilizers, and their expenses are much higher. Now, we do, I will admit, that what we can get out of an acre of land is also much higher. So yields are higher. In fact, they're about six times higher in corn. Um, and so the kind of losses we took back then, we can't possibly take today. Um, if 30% of, of the losses then and 30% of the losses today, that's a lot of money. Um, so the problem is that the promise of technology has not been borne out. It's not there. Uh, even if we had dropped the losses 5%, so we're only losing 25 to 27%, really? That's all we got out of 70 years of chemical use? I think we have to admit at this point that that little experiment was a failure. Yeah, we and the rest of the world are, are committed to using chemicals. Um, and the, that number, $40 billion, is growing fast. And you could also ask then, can we really sustain that? If we've gone from zero, well, not zero, but very low costs of agrochemicals 70 years ago to $40 billion, and we're still losing crops at essentially the same rate we lost crops 70 years ago, can we really afford to do that given the amount of damage that $40 billion worth of chemicals will do to the environment? I think the answer is pretty clearly no, we cannot. That is not sustainable in any sense of the word. Nothing about that is sustainable. So <sighs> that number is staggering. The majority, I think it's 23 billion, is used in the United States of that 40 billion. 23 billion for us, we are 5% of the world's population, and 17 billion for the other 7.2 billion people in the world. Um, one would think that maybe they're doing better than we are because they certainly aren't using the chemicals at the same rate we are. But it hasn't, we are the, I don't know if we, you'd call us the leader of the agri agriculture industry, but for, for a country that, that claims the high ground on technology and development and breakthroughs, I don't see us really leading to any future that is brighter than the one we had before. So um, we got here on, uh, we're that snowball rolling downhill. We're gaining speed, we're getting bigger and bigger, and we have no clue what's at the bottom of the hill. We just don't know, or how far away that bottom of that hill is. It could be tomorrow, it could be 10 years from now, but it is coming. I don't, think there, I don't think there's any way you could look at that math and not arrive at that conclusion. I don't really have a question, uh, an answer to why cotton consumes more chemicals than any other crop, and by far. But I will give you an example of what the problem is like with cotton. In, 19, in the ni late 1940s, there were three primary uh, crop pests. There was the boll weevil, there was a, a boll worm, and there was a leaf worm. And they were devastating cotton crops in the South. Um, and I think the, the, the state where it was hit the hardest was Alabama. And uh, when DDT was introduced, it was a game changer. It absolutely devastated the populations of those three pests, but only for about mm, five years. And then the pests were back, and now they were growing resistance in them. The problem was this, that when those three came back, five others came with them. So there weren't three pests after five, six, seven years. There were eight pests. <clears throat> Today, there are 33, at least 33 different pests on cotton. Some of them are just, we don't even talk about the species. We just talk about the genus because there might be three or four species within a particular genus like leafhoppers and, and, and some other things like that, thrips and mites and um, some of the really small things. So we went from, by applying chemicals, we went from three pests 
to 33 pests. Now, by the way, the emergence of those, those next five was because by applying DDT, we killed off all the predators in the field. All the spiders were gone, all the ladybugs, lacewings, grass, anything else that was going to eat, eat, but they were gone. And so any pests that had been suppressed by predators no longer were suppressed. The only thing in those fields now was things that eat cotton. And so they all realized that there were, there were no controls anymore. All the controls had been eliminated by DDT. And if there's one thing that, that, that chemicals do probably the greatest damage to environment doing, it's that, by eliminating beneficial insects. And that just opens the floodgates for the pests. So here we get into this situation where we have to start applying even more chemicals because now there's eight pests and we apply more chemicals and we, we hammer those pests and we, we try to just go after them. And the only thing that happens is we lose another chemical because of resistance and we gain more pests. And so here we are decades later, 10 times as many pests, we're using a quarter of all the pesticides used in, and that's herbicides as well as insecticides, uh, in America, and we have absolutely not conquered the problem. We haven't even come, we've made it far worse than it ever was. We poured gasoline on that fire. And that's why cotton, let's, I don't know why cotton itself uses that many, because this could happen in a number of other crops. But, uh, I mean, lettuce, for example, lettuce is tremendously uh, consumptive in terms of chemicals, except we don't grow that much lettuce. We grow lots and lots of cotton. You're just throwing gas on the fire. Well, uh, almost immediately, you can't even draw the line. It's like, here's DDT. Okay, we got you. You're hooked. I mean, we just gave you heroin, and now you're an addict. So, and uh, by the way, we've got more, so anytime you want more, just come see us. Yeah, it'll take some money, however. You might want to go to the bank before you come see us. Ninety-five percent of the corn in the U.S. is what's called dent corn or field corn. Um, it's called field corn in, for, as commodity traders refer to it as field corn. Um, it's called dent corn because that's what it looks like when it dries out. It's got a little dent in the end of it. Um, <clears throat> we don't eat that corn. That's field corn. If you're a deer hunter, you can feed it to deer, right? Uh, it's the corn that's made into all corn products. So if we're making ethanol, we make it from field corn. If we're feeding it to a livestock, we're using field corn. Humans don't eat this corn um, directly. We eat it as corn derivatives. So high fructose corn syrup is from dent corn, and that's how we consume it as in other ways. It's interesting that 95% of all the corn that we grow is not corn that we actually eat, but We've also gotten so that um, we have very little variation in that corn. So here's the thing with genetically modified crops. The biotech companies will invest in a crop if it's a crop that can be sold at a very large scale for a lot of money because it's going to cost them hundreds of millions of dollars to make this, this crop, this product of theirs that they have a patent on and they want to be able to sell it to a large number of growers and make that money back. So they're expecting by putting in $200 million into a new product, they're going to get a billion dollars in return. That's not going to happen with okra. It's not going to happen with raspberries. Um, but it will happen with and, and also, you can't store raspberries. You have to sell them immediately, but you can store corn. It's a commodity. So they're willing to put lots of money into this. Now, the thing about that, then, is that every genetically modified strain of corn is a single genotype. One genotype. That's what was patented, the genotype. Because the gene is in that particular germ line, and that's what was patented. And so every farmer that uses that product is planting a field that has one individual in it, just one, one genetic individual. There are 10 million of them out there, but there's just one. The real problem with this is, um, and the reason I'm sort of terrified of the idea of bioterrorism, is that if a disease comes along that affects that genotype, 
you lose every single plant, every plant. If you grow into a field of corn right now, there is one plant out there because it's a clone of every other plant out there. And there's no genetic variation. And the essence of a species is genetic variation. The ability of any species to adapt to its environment is genetic variation. If there is no genetic variation, there is no possibility of ever adapting again. And so, and this is on purpose. I mean, um, that's the way they want it. Now, if you think about corn, it's of uniform height. It's of uniform quality. It ripens at all exactly the same time. It grows at exactly the same rate. The, the ears of corn are this high and this high off the ground. The harvester gets them all at one pass. Perfect. It, it, it's a great, very efficient way to grow corn. But it is probably the most fragile system that you can imagine. It is ready, just waiting to be, begging to be disrupted by nature. And, and as we are now seeing with for anyone who keeps track of the news on bananas, the Cavendish banana is facing a fungus that it cannot resist. And if they don't do something, we'll lose Cavendish banana. Why? There is one genotype of banana out there in the Cavendish world. There is one. Every Cavendish banana in this world was derived from one plant. There's no genetic variation. There is no hope of saving that banana from eventually nature. And that's true of using crops that essentially have no genetic variation. They are, they are unprotected from the world around them without our help, I guess. That is the worst part about the, the Supreme Court decision to allow patenting of, of life, was that you, you're not patenting the species, you're patenting that. And you're only going to sell that. There's that seems on one hand, oh, well, so you didn't patent it at all. You just have that. Well, that's okay. You just have that. Well, yes, but that means for a big, big corporation, I'm going to have every single farmer in this whole area growing that. That's how they know. That's how Monsanto knows if some farmer's growing their seeds. All they got to do is go, oh, there it is. You got it. It's in your field. Therefore, you're stealing from us. I mean, that's the whole, that's how they can do that. It's like they have, they've got a little stamp and they're going, you got the stamp on the like you ever see blade runner when he when he found the little scale of the snake he took it to someone with a microscope and went oh yeah so and so made this scale because every scale on the snake had a, a, a upc code on it basically same thing that's what genetic barcoding is we we can essentially it's like forensic farming, you can trace every single seed out there now because it's got a, a genetic stamp on it. Agriculture simplifies complex systems. In fact, a, uh, um, probably uh, the happiest uh, uh, farm company can be is when there is one species in a field and that's it. Their species, their crop, and that's it. So that's the most simplified you can get. If we look at a natural system, there is any number of plants, any number of things eating the plants, and there are things eating the things that eat the plants. We've got the entire food chain and then the food web in there. It's very complex. There's redundancy at every level. Do we need that many plants? Well, each plant's doing something slightly different. Do we need that many insects? Well, each insect is doing something slightly different. They all have a role, they all have a niche. Um, and it's all balanced. No one is dominating. No one is gaining control. The others, some are specialists, some are generalists. No one can really control the entire resource. And so we get this complex, highly adjustable, highly flexible, very stable system because no one species can take over. When we start to simplify that system, we start eliminating species here and there. We reduce the number of plants down to one or two or three, just a few. We reduce the number of insects that can eat those plants. The others, we're eating other plants or they can't compete with the ones that are still there. So some insects are better, they're specialists. You can't kick a specialist off a plant because they're better at it than anybody else. So we get, what we get on our crop plants are there's a, a, one species in particular that eats roots. There's one in particular that really goes after seeds. There's one that goes after flower buds. They all have little specialties. 
<clears throat> as we simplify our agro ecosystems, our farming ecosystems down to one or a few species, we're going to simplify the number of pests down to those species that are truly specialists on those plants. And we're going to go after them with chemicals and they're going to adapt to those chemicals. And they're going to get better and better at preserving their role in that environment. They're going to become tighter and tighter, uh, more connected to that niche. And we're going to find that, and I'll give you an example, species like the green peach aphid. The green peach aphid obviously comes from peach trees. Uh, and it, it gets on the underside of leaves and they roll up and they wilt and it doesn't do very well. We've gone after the green peach aphid for decades with everything we've got. It is now resistant to over 75 different chemicals. <clears throat> it is the smallest, squishiest, softest, least protected little bug you'll ever see. You can smash 50 of them with your thumb. And yet we can't beat that bug. There's nothing we can do to beat that bug. And it is now on 50 different crop plants. It's on everything from cut flowers to broccoli. It's on weeds. It's on everything. We have allowed it to take over um, our fields by continually going after it with pesticides. So in this case, it's a very generalist species. But when it's on a particular plant, it's almost a specialist species. At any rate, what we're doing is we're forcing out all other insects and we are creating a haven for those insects that can adapt to our technology. And essentially, they have the complete run of the field. There's nothing there that can challenge them. There's, they have no predators. There's no chemical that can beat them. And we keep providing food for them. We grow monocultures, vast monocultures of plants that they love to eat, and there's not one predator out there that's going to stop them from doing that. They have no competitors either. And so, <laughs> as we convert the world to a much more simplified agricultural ecosystem, those species that can come along for that ride are winning the lottery. They are being handed the keys to the kingdom. They can tolerate everything we throw at them. They get along with us. They get along with the human world. They, they, um, they are well suited to the way we do things, and we're handing them um, tremendous success. And it's because we, of our insistence on this approach toward agriculture. The green peach aphid is not going to be a problem if there are 20 different crops being grown on 100 acres, and there's nearby forest land or brush land that Harvest that um, harbors birds and insects and wasps and bees and, and all of those other things that can come in and, and find food, insects that they're interested in, the green peach aphid is not a problem. Um, the rest of the world will catch up with it. But if we keep this very simplistic approach, this technological approach toward producing our food, we're inviting the worst of the worst to come along with us on that ride. We're growing this giant bowl of lettuce out there. <laughs> and insects are going, I like lettuce. And there's nothing we can do about it because we made that bowl of lettuce. So that's what a monoculture is, and that's why it's such a bad thing. And then add on top of that, let's get rid of all genetic variation whatsoever. I would love to talk, uh, I mean, I, ha I did in my book, but just this guy in 1951 at Kansas State who said, he wrote a book called Pest Resistance in Crop Plants. He didn't mean that the pests were resistant in the crop plants. He meant the crop plants were resistant to the pests, but only if you had a lot of genetic variation in the field, right? So that, oh, they might get that plant and that plant and that plant, but well, they didn't get the rest of the plants because the plants have their own level of resistance. And he said, we need to focus on this. So instead, we went in the exact opposite direction, said, no, let's eliminate genetic variation, and we'll just deal with it with chemicals. And he was saying, we don't have to deal with it, these plants are capable of defending themselves. We need to work with that. We didn't. It was 1951, yeah. He, he was already seeing the effects of chemicals. He was looking at DDT and going, oh, that's interesting. Sometimes the insects die here and they don't. Oh. He was also noticing that the insects that ate certain plants 
didn't die and some that ate other plants. Like it depended on what plants they were eating. The plants were actually giving them resistance. So there was a little aspect of that. But it was this, he was talking about this dynamic interaction between, you know, the, 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 the herbivore and its food. And he thought we really needed to, you know, work on that. That was very important. No. Skip that, move on. I mean, I've touched on that quite a bit. It's about diversity. It's about having that ecosystem there, the, the structure. I mean, we could, we could say, oh, you know, integrated pest management, but I, I, and that's where most farm advisors have gone. go, well, you need, you've got a lot of tools. You need to use all your tools. And I don't think that's the answer at all. I think the answer is more along the lines of the soil scientists go, start at the bottom and let's build an ecosystem. You don't have a problem. You don't need to worry about because even the, the IPM people will say, well, you know, if it, all, if it comes to it, you got to use chemicals. Go, I don't think that should be a solution ever, but. When I got the invitation to, to speak at the, the Real Truth About Health conference, um, I was a little skeptical because I had never heard of it before and I, I wanted to be sure that that I wasn't, um, I wasn't being invited just because I'm sort of anti-establishment. At least that's the way my writings might appear, and that, and that it would fit in to the general conversation. And um, Steve Shore, the organizer, assured me that you know, uh, don't worry about that. I'm going to put together a panel of people, and you will be speaking the same language. You'll be talking about um, shared interests. Um, and when I saw the names of the people he'd invited, I said, oh, yes, definitely. I think I, I, think I should do this. I mean, it's not just to, um, I absolutely want to get what I've been writing about out into the broader public. Um, but there, it depends on where you look, whether or not you're going to see my book. Um, it tends to be more on the science side of things. And I think I tried to write it to be accessible to literally anybody. Uh, I tried to write it at the non-scientist level. So the, the opportunity to introduce it to people that I might not have been able to reach, and also to spend some time talking with other people who've been writing on similar subjects um, was very attractive. I, I thought, no, oh, this is something I definitely can do. Um, a little bit of a commitment because it comes right in the middle of the semester and I should be teaching classes right now, but I think it's important um, to contribute to mm, conferences like this and efforts like this because what I hear being said at this conference is not part of the general conversation when we talk about food and health and agriculture and genetically modified organisms and other problems that we encounter in our society. So a lot of these things are swept under the rug and and people might claim, well, that's not important, or that's not real, or we don't need to worry about that. But um, when you consider all of the things that we're doing to our world and our environment that have a negative effect on our health as humans and as a species and as a world, I think it's important to bring these different elements together and see what kind of common ground there is among all of the people who are interested, and maybe work on that in the future. Thank you.